Hello, and welcome back to our uh, second to the last Lenten conversation um, Wednesday video. Uh, this has been a real joy, fun, joyous thing to do once a week. Uh, Pastor Robert Drake here and uh, Elder Dave Lamfer. Uh, Moorhead Presbyterian Church. These have been very fun. Uh, so let's go ahead and just dig in. Yeah. Um, I think we're obviously still in Mark. And what are we reading today? Well, today we're going to read about the institution of the Lord's Supper that we commemorate at the first of the month in our church. Actually, this year we will ha be having communion on Easter Sunday because uh, it is that first uh, Sunday of the month. So I'm going to pick up the reading in Mark chapter 14 and verse 17. Now, just to set that up a little bit, so prior in this chapter, Jesus is having dinner at, uh, at a friend's house, and a woman comes up and breaks a, bo a bottle of uh, perfume, actually, and anoints Jesus with it. And of course, Judas Iscariot was very angry about that, because we could sell that and make a lot more money, knowing that he was skimming off the, the money. Um, and Jesus clearly just says, she did the right thing. Says, the poor you will always have with you, but I am, you won't, won't always have me. You know, I love the way that you said Jesus was at a friend's house having dinner. Because, like, it, it, it really, the way you said it really personalizes Jesus. Because we have to look at two aspects of Jesus. Just the regular old person, fully human Jesus. And obviously the divine God, man, Jesus. And uh, so often we sort of, I mean, and rightfully so, we think of Jesus Christ, and yet, like you said, he was at a friend's house having dinner the night before, and here he is about to have dinner with his closest friends. So that was really awesome the way you said that. No, oh, just click, just clicked with me. Yeah, awesome. So we're picking up the story in verse seventeen. Uh, Jesus had told that two of his disciples, not one of the twelve, two of his other disciples, to go and get the meal ready for them, and how they they were going to do that. And then we come to verse 17. I need a little drink of water here. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely not I. It is one of the twelve, he replied, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. And then he took the cup gave thanks, and offered it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. I tell you the truth, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Well... I read. You get to start. Oh, my gosh. Almighty. <laughs> uh, there are so many. Um, so a few things happen. Uh, perhaps it also happens to you, especially if you're preparing for uh, a class or maybe a Bible study where you're with a group of people. Either you don't get enough time in the week, you don't make enough time, or you read a passage and it's like uh, I'm not, nothing is really jumping out at me. Um, I think last week I said nothing was really jumping out at me, though I had done some of my background reading. Uh, this week, it's I did very little background reading. Um, uh, here, here was one challenge that I, you know, knew in advance because uh, Dave and I picked these passages uh, a month ago, so we knew what passages we would be reading, but we didn't do any deep research together or have conversations beforehand. It's all just right here. Uh, so even just this morning, I was thinking about this scene uh, where Jesus serves his disciples 
um, his last meal, and it's the, the Lord's Supper meal, and this is my body and this is my blood. And because the, the overarching theme of what Dave and I are talking about is how does Jesus interact with people through each of these scenes? That's what we've been focusing on this entire time. This is what, you know, here's Jesus making his, his, his journey um, to the cross. And along the way, how does he interact with people? And what lesson can we take away specifically from his interaction with people? And this morning I was thinking, well, this one's really doubly tough because in this capacity, he is maybe just like with a healing story, he is acting beyond the capacity of normal human being. He is acting more within the capacity of his role as Messiah because he says this, for instance, this cup is the new covenant. This cup of wine that you are drinking is not just a regular cup. This cup fulfills the covenantal obligations way back in Exodus. Um, and so I was like, well, okay. What Jesus is doing is he is serving his friends. Um, he's being hospitable. And he is letting them know that an end is coming. And he provides a new understanding of the traditional covenant and the role of blood in that covenant. But then I drew a complete blank with, okay, well, what lesson can we take as I interact with people in my day with my family at the grocery store? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> so if that's what, I don't know. <laughs> Well, I, that's a good I mean, place to begin. Okay, I, I, would guess. I don't know. Okay, I don't know because I, I am not going to stand at a table and say that the cup of wine I'm holding is some special significance. That's Christ's role. So I don't know. <laughs> what I, what I find always interesting when Jesus is interacting with the twelve, especially if you read the really basically the three accounts in the Synoptic Gospels versus John, who does it a totally different way, a lot more teaching about the church and what we're all gonna be doing, but uh, the Synoptics are about the details of the, of the acts, of the actions of Jesus, is that clearly Jesus knew. He knew from the beginning of the chapter through the institution of the, of the Lord's Supper and then going out to Gethsemane, that these were the last hours that he would have in, at this capacity with his disciples. And I don't know, this is where I think he's really, you, you, the divine seems to come out to me, is because he knew what was going to happen to him. He knew what the plan was. Later in this chapter, he prays, God, if, Father, if it's your will, take this away from me. But if not, I'm going to yield to your will. But he already kind of knew. And I think, if I knew I was going to die in the next couple of days, what would I do? What would I say? How would I react? And here, Jesus, in other versions of this, he is watch he watches the disciples' feet. As the beginning, he does things that are very servant oriented mm. and not selfish. Mm. He's not being selfish. He's not. It's not about him. It's really about the others. That's a very interesting dynamic. Here, here's my. Here's some bread. I'm going to break it. Take this in remembrance of me. This is my body. They did not even know what that meant. They did not know what that meant. And the same thing with the cup. He's, he said it, and now looking back on it 2,000 years, we get it, right? We knew what he was doing, but think of the men in that room. They, they really didn't understand what he was doing until after Jesus' death and resurrection. They, here, they are, they are ignorant of what's going to happen. But Jesus is there, guiding, showing the way. 
and the importance of his sacrifice on the cross? Um, I, this would be a question also to all of you in the viewing audience. Uh, the times perhaps in your life when you have spent um, days or weeks with a loved one who is close to death, uh, is there something within us that becomes more hospitable to our fellow human beings, even to our family, as we get closer to death? So possibly um, is, specifically as we're looking at Jesus's interactions with people, uh, I think you really highlight uh, an important aspect, which is Jesus is very close to death, and he is becoming extra hospitable, washing people's feet in a couple scenes before this, and now serving food and wine to his disciples, and then taking the next leap that we cannot do, which, to, which is to say this bread and this wine represent a, a fulfillment of the covenant, a, a new covenant, actually. You want me to talk now? Go ahead. Uh, I could. <laughs> or, we, or, we could um, or we could pause and let the viewing audience um, maybe, I don't know, contemplate something. <laughs> pause the video and think about something. Take a couple notes. The thing that immediately follows us, I, I like that they say we, they do, uh, Jesus does the Lord's Supper for them. And then they say, and after they had sung a hymn, <laughs> yes, they I, left. I know I, what you're going to say, yes. I love that because how, what do we do? We model that yes, in yep. our church. Yep. We have communion and then you sing a hymn. Oh, that's not what I thought you were going to say. No. I thought you were going to say something else. Okay, okay. Okay. But, but... In the midst of that is Peter's deny, Peter's saying, yes. "I will never deny you. I will never yes. deny you. I'm with you to the end." And Jesus just says, "No, but tell you the truth. Yes, tonight the rooster crows twice. You yourself will disown me three times." That's a very powerful statement. So that's pr that's knowing the future. So it's po so, so what's so let's let's maybe go on the. Um, uh, the dynamic between those who know they're about to die, Jesus, um, or a person in your own family life, um, uh, and those who are still very much in life. So if you read forward um, a few sections and into the next chapter, uh, you will see that after Jesus serves the disciples his body and his blood and is super hospitable, the disciples pay him back by betraying him, denying him, sleeping, sleeping when he's in the in the in the garden of of of, um, Gethsemane. of Gethsemane praying. And then he like he gives them another chance, like he's praying, they're sleeping. He finishes. He comes back and goes, oh, my gosh, like, could you not just stay awake? So I, I, I'm going to go pray again. Stay awake. And then he goes and he comes back and they're sleeping again. So they don't know that death is imminent. No. So as we, as we ourselves know that our death is imminent, do we become more hospitable? And if so, why is that? And is the lesson that, well, why not be hospitable to that degree even when your death is not imminent? I think Jesus is unique. Obviously, yeah. That, that would no, be, no, no, yeah. I, I'm not saying, cool. but I think he has How? all the frailty of men because he's asking in the garden there with his disciples, he's asking for this not to take place. He did not want to die, willing to die. Mm -hmm. but he was, if, there's a, if there was another way, he asked his father that, is there any other way? very interesting right because I don't think we think about that we think he always did it willingly and and all that but if you read the passages when he's in Gethsemane he's clearly asking his father to take this cup away from him away. he does not want 
he does not want to die. Willing to die is different than wanting to die, hmm. right? Two different things. So he is willing to be obedient even to the death of, on the cross from Philippians. And that how Paul phrases that. But, yeah, I just think Jesus clearly demonstrates the human frailty of not wanting to die but the strength of deity saying, but this is the way. This is how this is going to have to happen. And he, when he did the Lord's Supper for the first time with his disciples, he did that knowing that his body was going to be beaten. He knew that he was going to die, and he knew that this was the ultimate sacrifice uh, for people to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And his father. So we, when I put that dynamic on it, I keep going, wow, I don't know if I'm that kind of a person that in the midst of all of that, I could be watching your feet, Robert, and, you know, serving people at dinner and <laughs> doing all those things. Because I would, the natural thing would be is, um, what about me? Why aren't you serving me? I need your help. I need you know, your service. I need um, your love. Uh, w one thing that, um, uh, so when you were talking about that, it did, it did bring to mind, um, if you were close to death, you don't know, you know, if you would wash my feet, for instance. Um, uh, we are filming on Tuesday, um, uh, Tuesday, what's the date? The twenty third, and um, Monday. Uh, afternoon, as we all know, there was a shooting in Colorado where where ten people were killed, and I was reading about that this morning as I woke up. I didn't know about it Monday evening, and I read a story of of, of one of the people who was there at the grocery store, and he was newly married, and he and his wife were in the grocery store together, and they were in separate parts of the grocery store, and then he realized it was gunshots and so he ran to the grocery store found his wife got her outside and said just keep running into the parking lot and he went back into the grocery store and this is what really struck me so this 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 young man went back into the grocery store where the shooting is still commencing to find two older women who were next to him in the aisle and he then found them and es and helped escort them out of the grocery store. And this, I, I don't know the man's name or anything like that, but he, he, death for him was very close. And he first made sure his wife was out, and then he went back in to find two women, he did not know who they were, strangers to him, to help escort them out. He lived, everyone's fine, I mean, 10, ten people died, but. I was like, that is hospitality to the stranger at a moment where your death is possibly imminent. Now, Jesus, like you said, is unique and different. Jesus is the Messiah. Um, but there is this lesson about our hospitality, how we treat people, whether or not we think we're about to die. Yeah, I agree with all that. I agree with it when Judas comes and gives him a kiss, and he doesn't chastise Judas. He doesn't chastise, does he? No. No, he doesn't. It's really do what you have to do. Do you think he was more mad at Peter or more mad at Judas, if you were to hypothesize? Well, he did say about Judas, woe to him, it would have been better if you had not been born. That's pretty dynamic. Um, but I think, again, Peter's the most impetuous leader in the disciples. He always shoots his mouth off. I'm going to stand up for you. He, you know, he steps out of the boat in the middle of the lake because he saw Jesus walking in water. And then he, he realized what he was doing, and then he lost his faith. Mm -hmm. That's why he sank. So Peter... It's probably that inner group of the twelve, but he clear and he probably knows Jesus better than some of the some of the other apostles. 
because he's kind of on the inner circle. Yeah, you know, with Peter, James, and John, that kind of that leadership group there or whatever. But he always wanted to go big. I will never betray you. I will never do that. It won't be. I won't. And Jesus, I don't think Jesus was mad, but he just, I always think Jesus is just saying it calmly. Well, you know, you will. And by the time the, the rooster crows twice, you will have denied me three times. Do you feel as though we are <laughs> captive to our human nature? Peter, Peter was captive to yeah. his human nature in that moment because he said, oh, no, not me. I'm going to be the best one there is. I would never do that. Captive to his human nature. Yeah. But I think part of the life change because of Jesus' death had not happened yet in the, in the apostles. He was instructing them. He was training them and doing all of this. But it wasn't until after his death and resurrection that the apostles got it and the coming of the Holy Spirit empowered them hmm. right so at this moment they are followers of Jesus they are his disciples but I don't think they understood in this chapter what that ultimately was going to look like was it going to be a revolution it wasn't going which be is what they were that. all they were looking for yeah. a revolution yeah it was going to be a revolution of the heart and a revolution of uh, religious practice. And this is what you used to do, but I've heard I come to make that sacrifice. Which is so exactly you, why he yeah. said, "This is the the cup of the new covenant." Right. Because they understood the the words blood and covenant. They understood that back from Exodus when Moses uh, uh, dashes blood on on all, on all the people. They understood the role of animal sacrifice and animal blood within the covenantal life of, of the Jewish people. Because they still were doing sacrifices at the temple. We talked about that, I think, yeah. two Lenten conversations ago. Yeah. So, yes. Um, well, uh, I think it's always good to, when you see Jesus exhibiting both the human part of him and the divine part. Because yeah. it makes it, to me, that again, just makes Jesus, and he is unique, obviously, but he, he, he's not afraid of either part of who he is. Mm -hmm. He embraces it all. Hmm. Well. I think we're good. I think we're good. Are you good out there? I we have a pretty good wrap up. Oh, we got one more. And uh, the next and last one is going to be um, chapter 15. Um, verse, uh, I think it's verses 1 through 15. It's where Jesus is before Pilate. And, um, and, and uh, Pilate is going to be handing Jesus over to be crucified. So the last interaction we will be exploring will be how Jesus interacts with Pilate. So, well, close in prayer? Yes. You ready? Yep, go ahead. Okay. Uh, Join us in prayer out in the viewing audience. Dear Holy God, it, it's a challenge for us, and we ask that you bless us as we embark on the challenge of, of understanding that uh, your Son is fully human and fully divine. Help us to understand uh, how we are to relate his life to our life, how we are to relate his love to how we are to love, and how we are to relate the forgiveness that is offered to us through him to other people. How are we to learn from your son in both his humanity and his divinity? Uh, we also want to offer a special prayer for all the families who are grieving in Colorado. May your Holy Spirit be with them and with the entire community and with our nation as we struggle with how we are to manage this country and manage, manage our relationships with each other and our hospitality to each other. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Uh, we'll see you uh, next Wednesday for our final Lenten conversation. See you next week, Robert. Okay. See you next week, Dave. Dave.
here on A. <clears throat> you all comfy and cozy? I'm comfy. All set? Okay, here we go. We'll do a pause and then I'll just say hello. Yeah. Hello. And welcome to our second to the last Lenten Conversations on Wednesday morning, afternoon, Thursday, whenever it is that you are watching this. They post on Wednesday morning. Uh, Pastor Robert Drake and Elder, should we start over? <laughs> you don't know my name. Well, no, I do know. You I don't thought, know. No. You don't. I thought maybe <laughs> you would say... Elder Dave Lanford. Okay, I can I can certainly do that. <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> but I just 